Thank you. Well, the images from that horrific attack and the memories of the dear friends and family that she lost are never far from Sandra Uringmana's mind. Why did it happen? Sandra's ancestors came from Rwanda, but for many generations they've lived in the Democratic Republic of Congo in search of work and peace. As outsiders, her people were constantly persecuted and targeted for tribal violence. When tensions reached a boiling point, her family of nine fled to a refugee camp in Burundi, imagining that they were finally safe, only to find themselves caught again in civil war. Burundi rebels identified them as the wrong ethnic group and slaughtered 166 people in the camp, including her six-year-old sister, Deborah, along with her aunt, three cousins, and a great uncle. Today, thanks to the UN, Sandra, now 22, is an American citizen, a university student, and an emerging voice from both here and in her homeland for the values of inclusion, peace, and justice. And in May, she's going to become a published author for the first time with her memoir, How Dare the Sun Rise. I'm so pleased to welcome her now. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you so much, Sina, for yeah. having me. So, Sandra, what you have been through is just unimaginable to us here in San Antonio tonight just unimaginable. So how have you managed to survive with such strength? Honestly, I don't know if I can call it strength because from a very young age, we grew up, we grew up in a, um, a country that is synonymous with war. And so I can't call it strength because I have seen people generations, my mom, my mom's mom, her mother, they all went through the same thing that I went through. So it's not strength, it's simply because we've normalized war. And children grow up thinking that war is normal and that hurt and PTSD is normal and we never get to talk about it. And I don't think I can call it strength because I've witnessed um, all the harsh realities of uh, my past now because uh, I'm in an environment where I get to see what normal is like and I get to see what um, rights and freedom is like. Um, so I can't, I, I don't yeah. think I can call it yeah. strength. So just, it, it was just normal. about people living in so much internalized pain after a while that they don't know any different at that point, which is unbelievably awful. So you were 10 when this atrocity actually occurred. And Tell us what your life in Congo was like before you had to flee to the camp in Burundi. My life in Congo was like any child's life. I had a happy family. Um, of course, we had war looming, but at the end of the day, family was important. We celebrated Christmases just like any other family, um, and we loved that. That was home. And so when people tell me that, oh, you're so lucky to be in America. I think of home and I think, I never wanted to leave home. I, I'm sure none of you would want to be uprooted from your homes, regardless of where you're going. You're still going to hold that dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. um, so Congo is my home. I love it. We have a lot of issues, but um, I wouldn't trade being from there for anything. Mm -hmm. When did you first become aware of how vulnerable your people were in Congo, though? Because even though it was your home, you'd always, because of the ethnic tensions, you, you know, you'd always felt that threat from your, for your family. How did you, when did you realize that you were a targeted group? I think for um, a long time, my parents sheltered me uh, and my siblings uh, from all the hatred um, towards the Banyamlenge people, which is the tribe that I belong to. Um, but I started to realize that when I started school with other kids and they would call me Rondiz, and they're like, oh, look at you, you're Rondiz, as if it's an insult to be from Rwanda. Um, and I thought it was an insult. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm from here. I was born here. My parents were born here. My grandparents were born here. Um, so I started to notice all of these things in primary school, that I was somehow, what I looked like, the shape of my nose, um, the, my skin tone, somehow was wrong, and the, my dialect was wrong, even though Congo has hundreds and hundreds of dialects. 
So I, I felt wrong from a very young age, but still refused to be called Randy's because I knew in my heart that I was Congolese and that deserved my place there. Mm -hmm. What was the boiling point that made your family leave Congo for the camp? Uh, well, um, the war was almost like in and out. We would flee and come back, and it was rare to finish a school year mm -hmm. uh, without having to flee or having to stay in. Uh, but in 2004, when the war broke out again, we thought it was the same thing. We thought we were going to flee in Burundi and then come back after several weeks after things had died down. Unfortunately, it was not that. Um, we then were attacked and forced to flee elsewhere. We weren't even safe as refugees. Well, I know how painful it must be for you, but can you tell, describe the night of the, of the massacre in the camp? Um, that is the worst night of my life. Um, and I, I still have not figured out how to ex put it into words, going to bed and waking up in the face of just horror and just seeing bodies everywhere, your friends and family. And finally, those people have succeeded in making you feel like you are nothing. The whole world is watching and your family is getting slaughtered and no one is doing anything about it. That's the feeling that still resonates. Did they come day. in the night, these tribes people? Did, who, who were the people who descended on the camp? The people who descended on the camp were from different groups. Um, so there were the Interahamwes, which were groups that were partially responsible for the Rwandan genocide, and there were also Interahamwes from Burundi and also militias from Congo who just felt like um, the Banyamulenge Tutsis did not have a place in Congo and that they were as Rwandan Tutsis. So it's this rhetoric that had been taught to us and to our fellow Congolese that somehow the Banyamulenge Tutsis were the only tribe that did not belong in Congo. And they, they came over the border to, to attack you in... in uh, they in came over the border. Never has a refugee camp been attacked. Who attacks a refugee point, a, a refugee camp? Like, what are you trying to, what are you trying to gain from that? We're already at nothing. We have nothing, and you're taking the only thing that keeps us going, which is family and love, and leaving hundreds of kids orphaned. It's just mm -hmm. unthinkable. So after that terrible night, you went back the next day uh, to look for family members that were missing, is that right? Yeah, so the, after the morning, everybody was kind of scattered because we all fled in different neighborhoods and we came back to the camp because you had no idea who had survived in your family. You had no idea if you still had parents or siblings or, it, so we came back and it was just a nightmare, something that you see in movies that should never be a reality for anybody. And um, we came back, and I, I remember looking for uh, my mother, and then finding her, and then learning that my sister had been killed. I remember um, learning that different friends have been killed, and families of my friends had been killed, and just walking and looking at bodies and realizing you know this person, you grew up with this person, and they're gone. What has been the international community's response to the massacre? I mean, have the perpetrators ever been brought to justice of any kind? Absolutely not. And that, to me, is what's most hurtful, that we can watch crimes like that happen and still claim to be powerless. I mean, it's just, it's like telling us that we don't matter, that our life means nothing to the world, and that we're just, we're confirming all the things that I have heard since I was a young girl, that I am, I do not belong, and my life was a mistake. And so to me, that's the most hurtful thing, to hear that the international community, and I, I speak, um, I tell my story because of that, because I know the pain that is in the hearts of many children and parents um, of not being acknowledged not having one leader stand up and say, 
these people deserve justice. These criminals deserve to be brought to justice. That's hurtful to me, and that is why I'm here, and that is why I tell the story. It's not because it's fun. It's incredibly painful to think about and to speak about, but I know that it is important, and I am continuously urging leaders um, to acknowledge us, because we do matter. Well, Sandra, you were 12 then when the United Nations resettled your family in Rochester, New York. And I can't imagine, after you've been through all this, anything more dislocating, really, than arriving in New York State in the wintertime, <laughs> not even speaking the language, and being expected to adjust after everything that you've been through. What were your first experiences of living in the U.S.? Oh, my goodness. The U.S. was... <laughs> something new, and Rochester, New York is definitely something new. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Rochester, New York, but it's possibly the coldest city in America <laughs> and the snowiest. So for us, we didn't even know that it was snowing. So we showed up to um, the airport in light jackets and jeans, just being like, hey, we're here and it was just not anything that we had ever experienced. So that part was uh, really tough, but also we didn't speak the language, we knew no one. Um, so we kind of had to bring, build from the ground, ground up, just um, making friends. <laughs> Learning the language is possibly the hardest thing to do in America. And, also building a community of people who have no idea where you're from. I say, hi, hey, I'm Sandra, I'm from Congo. And they're like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's in Central Africa, that big country. Uh, but, so it, it was really tough, but we were fortunate to finally um, find a community of very supportive people, churches, and um, we were welcomed. Mm. So how did your family get by? I mean, how did you make a living and how did your parents function, your mother at any rate, function in this environment? Yeah, I always tell my parents that we never had a chance to breathe. We were taken from our home and then the refugee camp, Gatumba, um, then being refugees in Rwanda and then being refugees in America. And we kind of never had a chance to breathe. And so we're, we're here, all of a sudden, you start to breathe and realizing, wow, I just came from a massacre and I lost family and friends. And the process of getting here, I hear, I hear this talk about, oh, we need to develop stricter ways for refugees to come into the country. Anyone who says or thinks that being a refugee in America or coming to America as a refugee is easy has absolutely no idea what they're talking about. It's one of the hardest things I have had to do. And so my parents worked really hard to, um, to make sure that it, we were healthy first and foremost. Uh, and my mom, who had always been my rock, was, took on so many jobs. I can't even imagine her walking into a factory and working with English speakers. Uh, this, she's, like, oh, she's only ever been to like fifth grade. So my mom is absolutely the most fabulous woman I know because of how much she has accomplished and how much she inspires us and how much she doesn't let anything stop her. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it's an amazing story. <clears throat> Obviously, ethnic identity has played, you know, such a traumatic part in, in your life. How have you experienced now being black in America? Being black in America is, um, I, I don't even know how to talk about it because I, sometimes I feel like I don't, I shouldn't talk about it because I don't identify with the rest of the black community. But I, then I realized that anybody that sees me in America, because I, now I speak English, they all think, well, she's African-American, and I am. I have citizenship now, so I am, by definition, African-American. And so being 
uh, black, I had to learn, because I no one has, had ever called me black. I had been called Randiz, Nyamlenge, Tutsi, but I had never been called black, because everyone was black. <laughs> So I had to learn what it meant to be black, and it was challenging to realize that I was now in a system that had not always been great for um, black Americans, and that it's still not good enough for black Americans, and learning all the issues that I now have to face because I identify as African American um, was another layer of my trauma, because now I realize that you know, I might have escaped that war, but there's still a great war to fight here in the U.S. as well. Incredible. So, tell me about the photographic project that pays tribute to the survivors of the massacre uh, that you have worked on and uh, reminds you of the people that you've lost. Um, the exhibit was... Um, was done by myself and my brother, and it was really because we were sick of people calling us victims, and we wanted to show them that we are resilient people, and that we are survivors, and that we can get through anything. All we want is acknowledgement, and also we want leaders to take action. We do not need pity. And so I wanted to show people that, look, these are the faces, and they're not by any means victims. They're survivors, they're the strongest people, that I know, and you need to see them as that. They've been through hell and back and still continue to achieve great things and to just, to just to be alive for some of us, it feels like an accomplishment every single day. Well, you're a junior at Mercy College now in New York and you're studying international diplomacy. What are your aspirations now? I mean, would you, do you want to go into politics and, and uh, maybe become a leader in, in Congo? Absolutely. One day I would hope to be in uh, one of those people that are making policies to make sure that girls like me and children like myself and people like my mother never have to go through what I went through. Um, but also, right now, we, are, um, we have founded an organization called Jimbere, which means Go Forward, that tries to reach remote areas of Congo where even activists are able to get to, even NGOs aren't able to get to because there's simply not even roads. You, you have to walk three days to get to where my grandparents live. And so right now I'm really trying to reach those communities through Jimbere, which you can learn about um, going on my Facebook or finding me. <laughs> well, in your book, which is being published next year, How Dare the Sunrise, what do you want people to take away from your story? Because they're going to read this extraordinary story next year and you know, they're, they're going to feel, as I do, absolutely inspired by you and wonder what you want us to take away from this. What I want everyone to take away from this story is n not just that I'm some girl that has been through war, but also that this is current. You know, I wasn't the last girl to go through war, and I'm not the last girl that's going to go through a massacre unless we all start paying attention to unseen people of this world and to areas that aren't reachable, unless we all start talking about them and being their spokesperson, there are still gonna be more girls like myself with stories like these. And my hope is that we all have amazing, positive stories to tell and innovators that come on the stage and talk about the greatest things that they're achieving to make this world a better place and not to hear about girls being tortured or being denied rights just because of the way they are. Well, thank you, Sandra. You're the most brave, inspiring woman I know, young woman I know. Uh, and I, I feel that you represent everything that we believe in, in women in the world, women of courage, women of strength, women of fortitude. It's really an honor to be talking to you tonight, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.